And so how did all this get started, you know, this Christmas thing? Well, some would say that there's many starting points, and they'd be right. But the flesh and blood starting point, if we might be so bold to call it that, comes just after Gabriel's famous message. You're familiar with that, aren't you? Gabriel's famous message, sometimes referred to as the Annunciation, recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and beginning at verse 26. In fact, those of you who are here this Sunday morning might be a little bit familiar with that, because that's what we talked about. But there we read, and the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And in those days, many people would ask the question, and is there anything good can come from there? Still, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, or Miriam, which in Hebrew means bitter. In fact, the Hebrews often would name their children and according to the circumstances of the birth. Maybe it was a hard birth, I don't know. You remember Jabez, you know, in the prayer of Jabez, and his name means, you bring me pain. Can you imagine that, having to live with that? Uh, right. Babies here, just Christopher and Gabriel, I think, right? Christopher, those are nice names. Hey, Gabriel! And then later he gets big and says, hey, Gabe! But can you imagine, hey, you caused me pain! How are you doing? How's everything? Or here, bitter! And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, or as we have it traditionally from the Vulgate, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you, which especially, I suppose, in light of what follows, suggests to me that God's perception of Mary was a great deal greater than the perception that she had of herself. And perhaps that's just the point and why she was the one. But Luke continues, but Mary was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern, you know, what's going on? What sort of greeting might this be? And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, or in the Aramaic, Yeshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. There you go. That's a good name for him, the one who would save us from our sins. And he will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, that is Israel, forever. And his kingdom, of his kingdom, there will be no end. <laughs> which reminds me of something Max Licato once said. He said, whether you live to be nine or 90, life is short, but the kingdom of God lasts forever. And Luke continues, and, and, and Mary said to the angel, and how can this be, these things that you're saying to me since I'm a virgin? That is to say, how can I conceive in my womb and bear a son having never known a man? sexually. And the angel answered her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, which is the description of an extraordinary thing indeed in, in which Mary will conceive in her womb by the power of the Holy Spirit and seemingly her virginity remains intact. It's not a, a, a divine mating as was often the case described in pagan myths. In fact, the Father is spirit and the Holy Spirit is spirit. These are non-corporal beings and yet they created all things and will do something in her womb to make it happen without violating her flesh. 
And so the angel continues in verse 35, and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy Son of God. And then he tries to make some, a bit of an argument, you know, to convince her maybe. Maybe he could tell on the, the look on her face that she needed a little more. And he said, and behold, your relative uh, Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. In fact, she, was, uh, she and Zechariah were rather old and were, never seemed to be able to have children. And that was a sort of tough. I mean, they were both um, from pr the priestly line and he was a priest and, and she was from the line of Aaron herself. And, you know, what's wrong with Zechariah and Elias and Elizabeth that they can't have a child? What have they, what secret sins are they hiding that the God is cursing them in such a way? And so it was a glorious thing and much a, a relief to Elizabeth that even in her old age she should become pregnant, who was called barren. Verse 37, for nothing, Gabriel says, will be impossible with God. In the last verse of this section, Mary says, And behold, then, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to your word. I don't understand everything that you're saying, but I'm here, and you can count on me. And Luke says, And the angel departed. And presumably, as Mary submitted herself and said yes to the thing that God was calling her to do, she conceived. But what about Joseph, you know? And here we're told about uh, Joseph's famous dream in Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, in which Matthew writes, And the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, that is, before they came together and their marriage was consummated, in fact, uh, at the time, and according to this culture, the betrothal was, almost, was practically like marriage. It just hadn't been consummated yet. But they hadn't come together, but she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's exactly the response. In fact, in Luke's gospel, we're told that immediately after Mary's encounter with the angel she, and her subsequent conception, she traveled south from Nazareth to Judea to be with her cousin Elizabeth, and she, who was already, as I mentioned, pregnant uh, for six months and had three months to go. And Mary stayed with her until her child was born. And after that, she returned to Nazareth. And so when Mary returned home, she was already then, by then, more than three months pregnant. These are peasant people, by the way. I, I, I can just imagine in my mind what that might have looked like. No one in her town was overweight because somebody just liked to eat food. These were people who ate enough food just to get by. They all were fit. And she was three months pregnant. And so Matthew continues in this telling Joseph's side. Her husband Joseph, uh, her betrothed, as we would say, even though their marriage hadn't yet been consummated. Her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to a public shame, decided to divorce her quietly or to end the call off the betrothal, to cancel it, to cancel the contract. Why? No matter what she said about it, how could he believe her? Who would make up such a story? But Matthew continues, and as Matthew Joseph was considering these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream at night while he was sleeping. And the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. That is to say, Joseph, Mary hasn't been unfaithful to you. 
For as the angel said, that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And the angel continued, And she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Matthew continues, And when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Jesus. Which brings us then to Jesus' famous birth. And we read in Luke chapter 2, and in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, it was the emperor at that time, otherwise known as Octavian. In fact, he was the first real Roman emperor. And that decree said that all the world should be registered And we're told that this was the first registration, or we would call it a census, when Quirinius was governor of Syria, another Roman, a governor in that area. And so Luke says, and all went to be registered, those who lived in the land, like Mary and Joseph, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee and from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. In fact, that was David's city. That's where David was from, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. In fact, it reminds us of Herod's uh, famous inquiry when he was asking, and where shall the Messiah, the Christ, be born? And so in Matthew 2, beginning at verse 4, and he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people, and Herod inquired of them where the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, was to be born. And they told him, quote, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, in particular Micah, as we have it in Micah 5 and verse 12. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so Luke continues, And while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for Mary to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling claws and laid him in a manger, that is a feeding trough for domesticated animals because as the text says there was no room for them in the inn and there's some debate about where Jesus was actually born in fact it it doesn't mention it in the text Uh, whether it was in a cave which is the tradition in the east or in a stable as is the tradition in the west or perhaps in a space within a human dwelling nearby where Animals were sheltered at night, which is an argument that's made by Kenneth Bailey in his book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. But whatever the actual location, the point is, is that the setting for Jesus' birth was a humble one. It was a peasant's birth. And not at all what we might have expected, given who Jesus is, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Which brings us then, finally, to the shepherd's famous witness. Indeed, we read, and Luke says, and in the same region where Jesus was born, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. Of course they were. It's like, can you imagine? I mean, it's night. They're like deer in the headlights. And the angel said to them, fear not, because they were afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, and and even for them, apparently. I mean, we have these, you know, crib scenes and what what do you call them, nativity scenes, and... uh, and you have the shepherds and, and everything and the magi, and they're just so cute, you know. Just, they're just adorable. Um, and all the little animals. Um, but in Jesus' day, shepherds weren't considered to be cute by anybody. Uh, in fact, they were generally 
held in suspicion as scoundrels. In fact, whenever they came into town, people would, and if they had anything valuable, they'd put it in a place where it was secure. Why? Because the shepherds are coming through. They were sort of the low of the low. And yet God decided to send the angels to announce it <laughs> to them. Fear not, before, be, behold, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you, you shepherds, <laughs> is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling claws and lying in a manger, a peasant's birth for peasants to behold. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts. It is a whole multitude, countless angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, on the lowest, peace among those with whom he, he's pleased. And Luke says, And when the angels went away from them, and all went dark again, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, just as they were told, lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. Indeed, the, the shepherds, to, to, to steal a phrase from, from Luke's writings later, in, in the book of Acts, they couldn't keep silent about the things they'd seen and heard. And so they told, the, the angels came. <laughs> and, and they said, and the angels said, don't be afraid. And, 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 then, and, and then the glory of the Lord shone around us. And then this message was given to us. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And that's him. He's the Savior. He's the Christ. He's the Lord. Yeah, Him. The one in the swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And Luke continues, And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Luke says, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, got to get back to the sheep. <laughs> the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And the Apostle Paul writing to the churches in Galatia said, And when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. The prophet Isaiah, writing hundreds of years before it ever happened, said, For unto us a son, a, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. And John wrote, and this is the verse I expect you know better than any, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I wonder, do you believe? Do you believe? Let us pray. Why wouldn't we believe, Lord? As John Stott said, the reason why 
faith makes so much sense is because there's no one more faithful than you, Lord. I may let myself down, but I have no memory of you ever letting me down. Because anyone who trusts in you can count on you. Even when things are not going well, we can rest in the fact that you're working all things together for good, for those who love God, for those who have been called according to his purpose. Lord, don't let this just be another Christmas come and gone. And for the gospel to be presented to us and for us not to be transformed by it. Give us open hearts to receive. Humility, emptiness to be filled up that we might have all the gifts that you wish to give to us. Gifts that money cannot buy. Things that come to us free but weren't cheap because they cost the Son his life that we might know life eternal. Help us to trust in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.